Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Queen Elizabeth, A Day in Her Life. Today, we're jumping back into the book, The Queen Mother, and we've been finding out a lot of information, and it was great information. The last episode, we had Elizabeth appearing before the public, and they loved her. Then they decided, at the suggestion of Winston Churchill, to go to Africa. It was an adventure of a lifetime, and the Queen Mother remembered the trip all her life with great fondness. So let's see what she is up to today. There was success at the British Empire Exhibition in 1924, so they decided to do a new one in 1925. It would be in May. The Duke had seen the Empire firsthand and had an enthusiasm and zest, and he wanted to talk about it. Because the Duke was the president, he had to make a speech at the opening. This made the Duke nervous because it was going to be broadcast by the new British Broadcasting Company, and he practiced it a lot. But the closer the day got, the more nervous he got. So I know how he felt about that, because any time I had to make a public speak, speaking thing, it was really nerve-wracking. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. So he had the right to be nervous, though. He was standing in front of a stadium full of people, people that were listening to him also over the radio, and he would be speaking in front of his father. So this gave the Duke some restless nights, and he went to Wembley the day of the speech feeling downhearted. His legs trembled and he stumbled over a few words, but he had a strong voice and it was steady. The Duchess stayed at White Lodge and she listened to the speech on a wireless. She was so relieved when the speech went well. It was, when it was over, the Duke said it was easily the best I've ever done. He said Papa seemed pleased, which was kind of him. The King, he wrote to his son, Prince George, that Bertie got through his speech all right, but there were some rather long pauses. And the Duke had a stuttering problem, and it was a source of anxiety for him and his family for a long time. So the Duke wasn't the only one who had to make a speech. Next, it was Elizabeth's turn. On July 15th, the Duchess had to open the first International Conference of Women in Science, Industry, and Commerce for the British Empire Exhibition. She was president, and she felt frightened. She gave a short speech, and she did a great job. She was starting to emerge as a public figure, and Elizabeth was becoming a great asset to the royal family. The Duke said that Elizabeth talks well to the mayors and the likes that shows and never looks tired, even after the longest of days. He said she was a darling, and I don't know what I should do without her. They took a summer holiday on August the 10th. Part of the time, the Duke spent it with his parents in Balmoral, while Elizabeth spent time with her family in Scotland. In a letter to the Duke, she told him to stick up for himself and to remember that he was an elderly married man, not to be patronized, and she told him that she missed him frightfully. The Duke replied by writing that he loved getting her letter. He was longing for Monday when she would arrive. He said, I miss you terribly, darling, in this awful room. It wants some of your letters lying around and a few papers on the floor to make it all homely. In the autumn of 1925, the Prince of Wales returned from his long tour of Africa and South America. The Duke congratulated his brother, saying, Your trip has been the most marvelous success from all accounts. He hoped the people in the United Kingdom would realize it when he returned. And he did get a great welcome home. The royal family and government ministries uh, gathered at Victoria Station to greet him. It was raining, but the crowds cheered the king and his sons as they drove back to Buckingham Palace and the queen and the duchess went back to the palace in a shorter, drier route. The crowds cheered again when they went to the balcony before dinner that evening, and it showed how popular the Prince of Wales was. But there were sad times at this time also. On November 20th, Queen Alexander died at Sandringham. She was 80 years old, and she had a heart attack. It had been 62 years since she was welcomed from Denmark as the Sea King's daughter from over the sea. She was a woman of gaiety and generosity. After her husband died, she continued to carry out royal duties and supported her charities. The last five years, she had become frail. She lost her hearing and could barely see, and she became confused. Her unmarried daughter, Princess Victoria, took care of her, and her son, King George V, visited her constantly. The king was saddened by her death, and they took her to the church where she had worshipped for 62 years. The next day, the Queen's funeral took place at Westminster Abbey, and she was buried beside her husband in St. George's Chapel, Windsor. The Duchess wrote the King to say, Dearest Papa, and that she was thinking of him, and she said, Words I know are useless in a tragic time, but I hope you will allow me to send you my deepest and truest sympathy from the very bottom of my heart. 
In autumn, the Duchess found out she was pregnant, and she began to have the symptoms by saying, I'm feeling much better now, though the sight of wine simply turns me up. Isn't it extraordinary, she wrote her husband. It will be a tragedy if I never recover my drinking powers. <laughs> so they waited till the end of October before they told their parents, and the Duke wrote to Lady Strathmore that it would be easier to turn down engagements since she was pregnant, and they would also not be making the constant weekend trips to Sandringham. The Queen agreed, and she thought that the Elizabeth should take care of her precious self. The Queen said that she and the King were looking forward to a direct descendant in the male line of the family, and the country would be delighted once they were allowed to find out. The Duke uh, and Duchess discovered Curzon House for rent and decided to move there and shut up White Lodge for the winter. The Queen, knowing the Duchess was pregnant, could not make an objection on the move back to London. She just hoped it wouldn't be too expensive. And the Duchess, for the first few months, kept her public engagements. Then, after the death of Queen Alexandra, the Duke was expected to stay on at York Cottage with his parents, and the Duchess wasn't feeling well, so she stayed in London. And the Duke went shooting during the day, but in the evenings he missed Elizabeth, and he loved to talk to her on the telephone. They couldn't say much to each other because the operators might be listening in, but they could hear each other's voices, and that was going to have to do. Elizabeth was able to join him for the traditional royal family Christmas in Norfolk, still at York Cottage. Christmas Eve, the Duke wrote Elizabeth. It was three years since he had waited for her to say yes. His heart still went pit-a-pat for her in the same way as it did then. He wrote the letter, even though they were just a few feet apart. He asked why he had written the letter to her while you're in the room. I don't know, but I just have. All my love, darling. To keep the Christmas cheer up, they brought down a cinema and a radio and a gramophone. The Duchess said to her sister May that Christmas went off quite well. Early in 1926, the Duchess made sure that the maternity nears who had looked after her and her sisters as babies, would be able to come to her in April. Her name was Annie Beavers, known as Nanny B. The lease on the house on Curzon was coming up, and the Duke and the Duchess wanted to rent another house in Grosvenor Square. The plans didn't work out, so they decided to go to the Duchess's parents' house at 17 Bruton Street. The baby was due in April, and the Duchess's doctors decided that the birth should be induced. Lady Strathmore had a temperature and couldn't be with her daughter for the birth. So now we're getting to the part where the future Queen of England was born. A little girl was born early in the morning, April 21st. The labor was difficult and the doctors had to do a cesarean section. The Duke was worried and anxious and paced the house. Queen Mary recorded in her diary at Windsor Castle she and the King were awoken at 4 a.m. to be given the news that darling Elizabeth had a daughter at 2.40. Such a relief and joy. The new child was the king's first granddaughter and the third in line to the throne, after the Prince of Wales and the Duke of York. That afternoon, the excited grandparents drove up from Windsor to Bruton Street. A small crowd cheered them outside the house. The queen noted in her diary that she saw the baby, who was a little darling, with a lovely complexion and pretty fair hair. She wrote her son that she was proud of her first granddaughter and that she was too sweet and pretty. And the Duke wrote to thank his mother. You don't know what a tremendous joy it is to Elizabeth and me to have our little girl. We always wanted a child to make our happiness complete. And now that has happened at last. It seems so wonderful and strange. I do hope that you and Papa are delighted, as we are, to have a granddaughter. Or would you have rather sooner had another grandson? He said he knew Elizabeth wanted a daughter. May I say, I hope you won't spoil her when she gets a bit older. Now they had to come up with a name for the baby. On April 27th, the Duke wrote his father to say their choice was Elizabeth Alexandra Mary, the names of the baby's mother, her great-grandmother, and her grandmother. The Duke said her first name, Elizabeth, was such a nice name, and there had been no one of that name in our family for a long time. Elizabeth of York sounds nice, too. The king approved at once and the newspaper reported Elizabeth's birth with enthusiasm. On May 26, outside Buckingham Palace, two nurses came out into the courtyard, and one of them was carrying baby Elizabeth. The infant princess was shown to the crowd who lined the railings, and the people were delighted. Later, the Duke and Duchess of York drove up to the palace and were greeted by sightseers. The baby was christened on May 29th in a private chapel at Buckingham Palace with water from the River Jordan. Elizabeth was dressed in the same cream satin and honiton lace robe 
that her father was christened in. It had been made for Queen Victoria's eldest child in 1841, and royal babies had been christened in it ever since. When the Yorks made their way to Balmoral at the end of September, they left the baby with the Duchess's mother at Gloms. Okay, um, next up, the Prince of Wales asked the Duchess if he could come and stay with them at Gloms, and the Duchess was delighted and told her mother he would love to come unless he's in the way. Do tell me when I come up. He's so frightfully modest and is terrified of pushing in where he's not wanted. So the Prince of Wales did go there and later wrote Lady Strathmore and her daughter. And to the Duchess, he wrote, uh, Darling Elizabeth, it was fun at Gloms and very sweet of you, your family, to have me stop there. And I was sad to leave you all last night. I miss you both. And you've been so sweet to me these last days. In 1927, the Prime Minister of Australia wanted one of the king's son to go to Australia in early 1927 to open the new federal parliament buildings in Canberra. So the Prince of Wales had made a very successful tour of Australia in 1920, and he would have been welcomed back, but the Duke of York wanted to go to Australia. Well, children, of course, couldn't go on such a long trip, so that meant that they would be six months away from their little daughter, Princess Elizabeth. This made the Duchess upset, and the King was anxious that the Duke might not be able to handle the pressures of the tour. His stammer was a concern and it might make it impossible to deliver, to deliver all the speeches that a formal tour would require. The Duke had the Duchess, but he was still despairing about his stammer and his failure to conquer it. He thought the problem might be a mental one more than a physical one. And this is when the speech therapist Lionel Logue came into the picture. He was recommended to the Prince's private secretary, Patrick Hodgson. The Duke wasn't anxious to see another therapist. They never seemed to help him. The Duchess said, just one more try. So if you haven't seen the King's Speech movie, you need to see that. It's a great movie, and they go over the treatments the Duke had to go through. The first part of the treatment was to teach his patients how to breathe correctly. He showed the Duke how to regulate his lungs and breathing to relax him. He had him do exercises at home, lying on the floor and reciting tongue twisters. So the Duchess went with him to Logue's Harley Street rooms or to his flat in South Kensington for the sessions. Logue said later that the Prince was the pluckiest and most determined patient I've ever had. When the tour of Australia came nearer, he got less nervous thanks to his treatments and he felt full of confidence. And before the trip, they found a new house, number 145 Piccadilly. It was a stone-built house and they were able to lease the house and in return White Lodge was leased out by the Crown. The new house needed attention, and Queen Mary jumped in to help. She insisted on inspecting the house early on. She wanted to see the before and after. She thought they should keep all the furniture they wanted from White Lodge, and she promised them a check for 750 pounds to do a room at her expense. She found them some chandeliers at Osborne, and the king lent them another from Balmoral. Lady Strathmore gave them furniture, a walnut bureau, and an octagonal card table. The Duchess was happy for the help. It was more expensive moving than she thought it was going to be. She couldn't use the curtains from White Lodge because the windows weren't the same size, so she had to get 14 new pairs of curtains. The move, though, got her mind off leaving Elizabeth. She was a joy in their lives, and the Duchess wrote the nanny, saying, She's grown so big and is as sharp as a needle and so well. She sleeps beautifully and has always got a smile ready. After the new year, when the tour date approached closer, the Duchess became more miserable. Both grandparents wanted her, so Princess Elizabeth had to spend time with Lady Strathmore in the country, and the Queen wanted to have her for at least three out of the six months. The Prince of Wales threw them a farewell party, and many of their friends came to say goodbye, including Fred Astaire and his sister Adele. The Duchess wrote that she did a Charleston with David, the Prince of Wales, for nearly 20 minutes, home at 3.30, bed at 4. Oh, Lord. Well, it wasn't the next morning, but... The morning that they had to leave, the Duchess awoke and rose early, feeling miserable and about leaving the baby. Went up and played with her, and she was so sweet. Luckily, she didn't realize anything, and when they were ready to leave, Allah brought the baby down to say goodbye. The Duchess was very emotional. Watching Princess Elizabeth play with the buttons on her father's uniform quite broke her up, she said, and the Duke was miserable, too. He thought his daughter would be grown up when they returned. The Duchess drank some champagne and tried not to weep. At Victoria train station, Queen Mary saw her daughter-in-law being brave. 
Queen Mary decided not to bring up Princess Elizabeth at Portsmouth Harbor, the Duke and Duchess had a rousing send-off. I will end the video here, and we found out the Duke and Duchess were human too, and got very nervous before their speeches in front of large crowds. There was a joy in the birth of Princess Elizabeth, and a sadness at the death of Queen Alexandra, a beloved woman to all who knew her. The Duke and Duchess had to move a few times, and that got to be expensive. And then the Duke wanted to see Australia, so the King gave him and Elizabeth approval to go. They had to go there to open up a new Parliament building there, and the only trouble was they had to leave their baby daughter Elizabeth for six long months, so that had to be very hard on the both of them, because they adored her so much. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would be greatly appreciated. I wish everybody a good day, and tune in again soon for another episode of Queen Elizabeth, A Day in Her Life. Thank you.